preaching today from 2 Samuel 19, verses 40 through 43, page 374. 2 Samuel 19, starting in verse 40. Listen to God's word. Now the king went on to Gilgal, and Chinham went on with him. And all the people of Judah escorted the king, and also half the people of Israel. Just then all the men of Israel came to the king and said to the king, Why have our brethren, the men of Judah, stolen you away? And brought the king, his household, and all David's men with him across the Jordan. So all the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, because the king is a close relative of ours. Why then are you angry over this matter? Have we ever eaten at the king's expense, or has he, has he given us any gifts? The men of Israel answered the men of Judah and said, We have ten shares in the king. Therefore, we also have more right to David than you. Why then do you despise us? Were we not the first to advise bringing back our king? But the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. Go across the, the chapter here and read the next verses, two verses as well. And there happened to be a rebel whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And he blew a trumpet and said, We have no share in David, nor do we have an inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So every man of Israel deserted David, followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah, from the Jordan as far as Jerusalem, remained loyal to their king. Over the Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays, there is something of a tradition in our house. We will set out a table and spread a puzzle on the table. Uh, Maybe you do something like that, too. It seems to be a common common holiday uh, practice. I want you to imagine that you've been working on that puzzle for weeks. It's one of those really difficult ones. And you, you, you are getting very close to it being done. You have maybe a maybe hundred pieces left out of a thousand piece puzzle. And you get up one morning and you come out to the table where the puzzle is and your cat has jumped up on the table and has scattered it everywhere. Well, you'd be pretty frustrated at that, wouldn't you? I want you to remember the efforts of King David to put all of the pieces back together in the nation of Israel. There had been division because of Absalom's rebellion. There were those who followed Absalom, there were those who followed David, and they were separate. They fought against each other, literally killed each other over this division. But David, anointed by God, by his spirit to lead his people Israel, prayed and and worked to heal the breach that had happened because of that war. He showed mercy to those who had rebelled against him. And this was part of his effort to bring all of those scattered pieces back together. And just when it seems like he's on the verge of finishing that work, it's blown up by this quarrel that happens. David set out to heal that breach, but the sins of Our hearts that are so common destroyed that peace. We see that it even descends into another civil war, another rebellion, another separation of those who follow Bikri or Sheba and those who follow David. 
This is a passage that gives us an opportunity to think about the very real common sins, the very real threats that serve to be peace breakers amongst the people of God. I'm going to explain some of the things that happen here, but I also want to draw them into our situation to warn you about those sins that are very common to us, that can drive brothers and sisters apart, can shatter the, the blessed peace and unity that we have as the people of God. It will call us to work hard to pursue peace as far as we are able. But ultimately, it will lead us to look to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the only foundation for peace, and who is the Prince of Peace. Well, let's start with the quarrel between Israel and Judah. There's some explanation that's needed here. It's a little confusing because you might say, well, I always thought that Judah was part of Israel. And that's true. But the title... Israel is used in a couple of different ways in the scriptures. First and foremost, it's used of the nation of Israel, which was made up of the 12 tribes, the children of Jacob, the children of Israel, 12 different tribes that make up the nation of Israel. You might think of it today as we have one nation, the United States, but Within that United States, there are 50 different, different individual states that divide, divide us up. So that's uh, one way of understanding what's going on here, that Judah is indeed part of the nation of Israel. But more and more, there is something of a, a division that is growing amongst those 12 tribes. There were 10 in the north that followed Absalom, and that will later be divided off after, after Solomon dies. You might remember that the nation is divided. And there are ten tribes of these northern ones that are increasingly called the men of Israel, the people of Israel, as in opposition to these two other tribes in the south, led by, the, led by Judah, really, because of David's kingship, of being a more prominent, more populous, more powerful tribe. So you have this division between the men of Israel and the men of Judah. That will help you to understand what's happening here, because as you read in verse 40, you see that David has, has now entered back into, into the nation's borders of Israel. He's pro, uh, crossed the Jordan River. And he's being led to Gilgal, where there's going to be uh, this reunification. And Judah takes the lead in this, what had to be a celebration uh, procession. And it also says that half the people of Israel joined in this escort. And when you see that half the people of Israel, it will help you to read what comes next. Because it appears that half were left out somehow. Only half were able to join in this escort, and half were either late to the party or were intentionally left out. It doesn't say, but... What we do know is that the men of Israel, who had, had been left out, took offense at what has happened. And at this point, I, I, I'll just make the observation that as, as is often the case, quarrels can happen over some of the weirdest, silliest things. Now, there may be some reasons why Israel is going to take offense, and, and, and I'll explain those, but at, at sometimes it just feels like little boys on a playground that uh, will say something that uh, you look funny, and, 
and well, well, you look funnier, and well, yeah, but you're whatever comes next. Pretty soon the tongue is stuck out, and, and then pretty soon the fists are flying. We can smile a little bit at that, we can laugh a little bit at that, but the quarrel that happens here in Scripture, and the quarrels that happen here amongst the people of God are real, and the consequences are real, and they're devastating. I want you to, to feel that and feel the call to pursue peace that we're driving towards. So here's what it seems, the, or here's what the Israelites say. It's not what seems, this is what they say. They go to David and they say, why have our brother, brethren Judah stolen you away? In other words, Israel's feelings were hurt. They interpreted what had happened as a slight against them in this important event. Almost like they saw Judah taking the place of honor in this celebratory parade, and they think they deserved that honor. They deserved that place. But Israel, in all honesty, has blown this out of proportion. And they've interpreted Judah's actions in the worst possible light. The truth is that David knew how Israel had asked, asked him to, be, to come back as king. That those ten tribes who had followed Absalom had, had humbled themselves. They said, we, we do want David back. And they were the first to go and ask. And since the te text records this, it would seem that Israel knew that David knew. That's why I say I think they're blowing this out of proportion. I also say that Israel stepped too far in, uh, in presuming to know what was going in the, in the minds of the leaders of, Ju of Judah. They presumed to know Judah's heart and Judah's motives. And it comes through in the way they frame the question. Why has Judah stolen you away? Asking the question is an accusation, uh, accusation of intentionally taking what they thought belonged to them. The point here is that uh, Israel did not know what Judah's intentions were. Now, in all honesty, we have to stop and say that it may have been intentional. Judah is not faultless in this quarrel. We'll see more of that in a moment. It's easy to come to a conclusion that, that Judas saw this as an opportunity to get one up on those northern tribes. But the point is, we don't know. And the presumption of motive is warned against in many places of Scripture. And the consequence of that presumption here is that Israel does indeed take offense over Judah's actions. And isn't it such a damaging contributor to quarrels to begin to try to guess what that other person meant by what they said, or to think what their motives might be by what they did, and then to interpret that conflict in something that you really have no knowledge about. Pretty soon the fists are flying. You can take it a step uh, further too because Israel says, why has Judah stolen us away from us? Not only did they envy the honor, but they 
envied and desired the access to the king that they thought that they would have by this honor. And once again, there may be things in the background that would stir this up. Jerusalem was in the midst of, uh, of Judah, and David had, had located it there. That's his tribe, but he had located it closer to the northern tribes so that there would be access. The temple was in Jerusalem, or excuse, the tabernacle was in Jerusalem. Again, David intentionally moved the tabernacle there so that there would be access. But it would be easy to assume that Judah had all of the access in Israel. Those other tribes had none. And they could think that they were maneuvering the king into their camp. Became jealous then of Judah snatching that out of their hands. There is a fragile peace that David has has fought for and seemingly has been bringing those pieces together and lines start to grow greater. The cracks between these two factions begin to appear. What sins did Israel commit? I'll name a few. As you meditate on this passage, you might find others you could add to this. But let me start with the sin of envy. Now I want to draw it into our own circumstance. Israel was envious of the glory that Judah was receiving, maybe even grabbed for themselves. And envy is one of those sins that sours you towards those around you. You know the term green with envy? It, uh, it poisons your relationship because not only do you want the thing that your brother or sister has, but you are, uh, are upset that they even have it. And it destroys the, the joy and the peace that might come naturally for someone who has an honor or uh, it receives an acclamation that uh, you think ought, ought to belong to you. And so if you can't have it, they shouldn't have it either. The lines of division, the cracks begin to develop. I'll mention the sin of pride, of seeking after their own interest. Their toes were stepped on. That's what pride is like. And how often division within even good friends happens when you step on their toes. It's an offense, and Israel took it. So do we when our pride leads the way. The cracks of division grow greater. Think of the sins of assigning motives to someone else, of thinking evil of your brothers, of imagining you know what your sister meant by that. 1 Corinthians 13 says that love thinks no evil. Love is not provoked. Love instead pursues and thinks the good of those around you. The lines of division are, uh, are growing more and more by these common sins, common sins that are peace breakers. Well, that would be bad enough. That's just one verse here. And it's only one participant of the quarrel because Judah does indeed have their own contributions to the faction and to the, uh, 
to the fractures that are developing, Judah's sins add fuel to the fire. Israel asks, why has Judah stolen David away? And Judah answers, because David is from the tribe of Judah. He's our relative. Now, it must be said that this is the truth. But it was insensitive. You can say that in a couple of different ways. You could, you could say that in a way that, that is trying to seek understanding and, and explanation. Or you could say it as, uh, you could say it with your tongue out. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. David's ours. Mm-hmm. Take that. <laughs> yeah, that's not in the text either, but you can... <laughs> <laughs> What is in the text is what they go on to say. They they didn't seek to placate their brothers, which wisdom would have offered. Soft answer turns away wrath. They could have said, oh, wow, I I do see that was insensitive of us. We, We didn't wait for the rest of your company to come. We didn't. We didn't give you any attention for the honor that you gave in inviting David back. Instead, they, uh, Judah got defensive as well. After speaking the truth, and they say, why are you angry? We have never taken advantage of our relationship to eat at the king's table. We have never had special gifts from the king. Why are you angry at us? Once more, true, but they failed to see how they now shifted the blame back on Israel for being angry. Again, they did not seek to placate. For that matter, it, perhaps it was intentional, and this was an opportunity for them to say, you know, you're right. We have sinned against you. We, we did take something that, uh, that ought to have been yours. But they didn't. And by adding fuel to the fire, they contribute to the quarrel. They add to the tension, like pouring gasoline on a fire that has already started. Instead of following a path of peace, they follow a path of peace-breaking rather than peacemaking. So what were Judah's sins? And once more, I'll invite you to to meditate on this passage today and to add other things that uh, beyond what I add here today and apply them to yourselves, as I will do. Judah responded to Israel's anger with, anger of their own. They had been provoked. Love is not provoked. 1 Corinthians 13. Love is not provoked. That is, uh, that deserves a lot of meditation, doesn't it? Provocation means that likely you were sinned against. But love is not provoked. Love covers over a multitude of sins. Love listens and says, Ah, I I see how I have sinned against you. Please forgive me. Or I, I see how I have not sinned, but I have offended you. I want to make that right. Judah's insensitivity was rude. Love is not rude. First Corinthians 13. 
catching a theme here. Love is not rude. I illustrated by sticking my tongue out, and uh, it's, uh, it is so easy when someone is rude towards us to, to just give it right back. In, uh, in hockey, uh, you can ask Dan about this, there are certain people that are called agitators. And uh, what they do is they skate around and with, uh, with their words, with their actions, they're picking a fight. And they're just wanting somebody to drop their gloves and get in it with them. Rudeness agitates rather than being a peacemaker. And honestly, I think Judah demonstrated a lack of patience, a lack of kindness towards their brother. If you read through 1 Corinthians 13, you're going to see how all of these elements of love are being violated in this quarrel between Israel and Judah. It's in a sense... Uh, Judah paraded itself in the eyes of their brothers and, and did indeed provoke Israel. So Judah responded in kind. Guess what happens next? Well, Israel just adds to the trouble, and then Judah adds to it again. I'll call it that Israel and Judah become entrenched. We have 10 shares in the king, says Israel. That's referring to the 10 tribes of, those, of that northern group. We have, we have 10 tribes. We have a greater share in the king than you do with just your little two tribes. We have a greater share. So we ought to have David. We ought to have the king. Gasoline added to the fire. Why then do you despise us, says Israel? Were we not the first to advise bringing back our king? And I think right there is the, is the offense in the nutshell. They saw Judah despising them. And nobody takes kindly to that. Intentional or not, Judah had indeed offended Israel. Real or not, Israel had taken offense at Judah's actions. And Israel doubles down on this, as does Judah. The text ends with the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. Here, it doesn't even say what they said, but you can... You really don't even need the words. All, all you need is this fierceness of words flashing back and forth, and you can picture it. They're standing toe-to-toe. -to -toe, their faces are red. Their voices are elevated. And what happens next is that Israel stomps out of what was supposed to be a celebration of the coming back together of these divided tribes, that peace that David was, was working hard to broker. And it was scattered to the wind, especially when Sheba sounds the trumpet and says, that's it, we have no part with David, we're out of here, every man to his tents. So all of those who uh, are accounted here as men of Israel leave this, uh, this celebration, leave this procession, and they go back to their own regions. It's no surprise that a quarrel boils over into warfare then, and civil warfare. Fragile peace that David was longing for and working for was shattered, really even before it had begun. So let me draw this all together. I've been making some applications all through this, but 
let me say once again that peace and unity are a fragile thing. This passage vividly demonstrates the sins that break peace rather than make peace. We've looked at pride and envy, impatience, unkindness, rudeness, thinking evil of your brothers, presuming motives, assigning, uh, assigning guilt, being provoked, remembering and counting sins against you, letting that provocation burn and turn into anger, wrath, and malice, provoking others, poking them when they're down, calling attention to their failings. Is it any wonder that offense is taken when these sins are part of the people of God? Is it any wonder that the fragile peace that David was brokering brokering was, was shattered? You might put it in another way. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it amazing that we, as the people of God, could indeed come together? That is a God thing. It has to be a God thing because David was not the Prince of Peace. I'm not the Prince of Peace. You're not the Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. We are held together. Brothers and sisters, we are held together by Jesus. And if there is any other thing that you think is holding us together, it will fail. It has to fail. Because it's not grounded in Jesus. The union that we enjoy is because each one of us has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Not one of you, not one of us, is, is, is special in God's eyes in that way. We are not above one another. We are all receiving of the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. And that ought to humble us as we look at our brothers and sisters in Christ. And you should see each other as those that are redeemed just like you are, needing your sins to be forgiven, needing the Spirit of God to help tame your tongue, needing the admonition of the Lord to correct you when your thought process goes down that road of assuming motives, assigning guilt. We all need Jesus. I'll close with the words of Paul and of Peter. I read these earlier from Paul in Romans 12, 17 and 18. The heading for that chapter, behave like a Christian, and all of that portion is really wonderful, but verses 17 and 18, repay no one for evil, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. From Peter, he who would love life And see good days. Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking lies. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Brothers and sisters, let's do this in Christ's strength. Let us hold to our Prince of Peace, and pray that he would hold on to us and direct us in making peace with one another. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we do pray this way. In fact, O God, we pray with confession of our sins in this area. 
God, as we are united to Jesus Christ, I pray that you would teach us and help us what love is, and that we would pursue that with one another in a peaceful way. Help us to set our eye, excuse me, our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Pray, O oh God, that, that you might pour out that spirit of peace upon us. For God, if it were up to us, we would degenerate into schoolyard fighting so easily. Instead, O oh Lord, help us be quick to hear, quick to repent, quick to forgive, to seek peace and to pursue it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Close by singing Psalm 133a. This psalm speaks of just the, the glory of the peace of God that's poured out on us. It is a reality, but we also pray for it too, don't we? So let that be your attitude as you sing this, praying for it and praising God for the peace we have in Jesus. We'll stand and sing Psalm 133a.